Goodness me, if I'm not mistaken, and I often am, it looks like we got us a convoy. Yes, an illegally overloaded and highly dangerous one right out of the blocks. Well done there. And so many Australians managed to do this. So in this episode, I'm going balls to the wall, striving to be 100% frown upside down on your bad towing choices. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the card that's up there now, dude. This report is inspired by you. In particular, you if you are a dude named Harvey Singh, prospective Dingo Piss Creek visitor, looking at going the works burger, the ute and the big van, intending to inflict caravanning all three and a half friggin' tons of it, and the great Australian outback, cruelly and unusually, on his unsuspecting family. He's clearly something of a ticking time bomb. Subject, I Suzu D-Max, but need more help. We are a family of five looking at getting a 4x4 and caravan or camper trailer, unsure, need help with choosing the right vehicle to tow three and a half tonnes. <sighs> Harvey, Harvey, Harvey. Harvo, mate. That's just not gonna work, son. I will show you the cold, hard beer garden engineering numbers and prove it to you in just a sec. And I will also proffer a solution which hey, you will not enjoy, but anyway. Because caravanning is, in my view, a kind of widespread mental illness. And the COVID, as Pauline Hansen would say, has only made this worse because international travel has become just a fleeting memory. But imagine going to the doctors one day and telling them that you are sick of repetitively flushing your morning motions down the pipe and ultimately into the ocean. Instead, you have decided to take your precious ablution on tour across this formerly great nation, which today can offer humanity only the world's leading collection of dud politicians. And a fabled creek, of course, fueled by desert dogs. You might further explain in the surgery inside that, the sanctity of the consultation suite that your ute loves your caravan very, very much and seeks nothing more than to insert its tow ball deep into the caravan's drawbar in the hope of travelling endlessly as one to the fabled ammoniated billabong. Long sleeve cardigan with fasteners up the back stat. Here's what the doctor will prescribe, I have no doubt. Just wait here, sir, in this room with mattresses all over the walls while we sort out the paperwork. Job done. There's a good chap. The fact is, mate, utes and three and a half ton towing are a match made in hell. It is entirely impractical and manifestly unsafe even to think about it, okay? Don't go there. Most ute makers tell you that you can do this, but in practice, you can't, and the numbers really don't lie. If you attempt it, you are unwittingly perhaps something of a moron, and being cavalier indeed with your own safety in my view. Obvious place to start this beer garden physics dissertation is the distinction between the two most common types of trailers out there on the road. The dog trailer and the pig trailer, named obviously after man's best friend, and the progenitor of bacon. Both very important roles in modern society. <coughs> they can agree. So the dog trailer has these axles at the ends, wheels at the corners typically. It can have two or three axle groups back here and a couple of axle groups up here, or not, depends on how much weight it's carrying. But that's where they are located, and it's the location of the axles that makes it a dog trailer. Whereas your box trailer, your boat, your caravan, your dingo piss creek adventurer type trailer is a pig trailer, and the distinction there is axles in the middle, dude. It can be a single axle or a double or even a triple, but they're all in the middle, and that gives these trailers 
different applications and different kinds of dynamic performance. So let's think about that. And the obvious example here is braking. Like you jam on the brakes, what happens to your head? It goes forward, doesn't it, you know? Because you're accelerating that way and your velocity is that way. And that leads to this inertial pitching kind of motion which is exactly what happens to your trailer as well, okay? So it's just like a spanner here and an inertial load causing rotation like that in the plane of pitch, okay? Your dog trailer is really, really good at restraining pitch, which is fantastic because the application of these things is carrying really heavy loads, okay? And your pig trailer, not so much more of a seesaw because it's got mass up the front here outside the axle group and mass down the back outside the axle group and this means that when you jam on the brakes and pitch forward this is going to have an effect on the vehicle doing the towing right it's going to jam the back axle down and lift the front end up and make the steering less effective and it's dogs and cats living together in extremis let me tell you and the same thing happens in the plane of yaw which is rotation like a kitty's top in the horizontal plane okay your dog trailer because of the location of these wheels at the corner it's really good at restraining motion like this in the plane of yaw and your pig trailer not so much okay because once again, there's mass out the front here, outside this boundary of the axle group, and there's mass out the back. So when that gets moving, it's really hard for the wheels to restrain that. And obviously you can have this whole compound pendulum thing happen where the trailer nudges this way, and at the same time, it's a hinge in here. So it's nudging the vehicle doing the towing that way, and then it springs back and you end up with the death wobbles. Not so common with a trailer like this because it's much better restrained in pitch and yaw. Think about that next time. And you've got to ask yourself, why do we use trailers like this? And I suspect, although I've never had it confirmed, that we started out with small trailers like this because they're pretty simple to make and they do an okay job when you're just pulling a few hundred kilos here and there, rubbish to the tip and things of that nature. And they've just gone. And all of a sudden we've got these Mr. Creosote of pig trailers driving around on the roads, 3,500 kilos of them, roughly one ton heavier than the vehicle doing the towing. And that leads me to channel my inner engineer. And you know, when I went to engineering school, we learned all about all these different failure mechanisms and how to mitigate them, okay? Because that makes sense, right? Think about a really simple example, like a beam that supports a load. This could be a bridge, right? You've got one bank, the other bank, and you've got all this distributed load on the bridge. It's really bad if the bridge fails, okay? Like every time, there's never been a good bridge collapse, okay? And you've got to go through this whole process. I've got these two steel beams. One is directly over my head right now. Another one's about two and a half meters back that way. And it holds the house up above the fat cave, right? And it could be this. It's exactly loaded in this way. It's got a distributed load over the top. Some of it is a static load and some of it changes with time as the dog runs in and out and whatever, you know, you move the furniture around. But it's got this distributed load. And in order for the house not to friggin' collapse, you've got to go through this beam design whole philosophy, right? Where you evaluate the maximum bending moment in the beam to select a beam that's big enough that it won't yield under the load that you apply, plus a safety margin, all right? And then you've got to look at how the loads are applied here in shear and any big point loads like that, because they can lead the web of the beam, which is this vertical bit in the center here, they can cause that to buckle. That's bad, okay? And you often see beams with these little bits of steel welded in here, these web braces that uh, basically stop the, the uh, guts of the beam from buckling, the web from buckling. It's just a stiffener that's welded in place at places where point loads are applied. And it's for exactly this reason, okay? And then you've got to think about other things like, is there any capacity for the beam to be loaded eccentrically? Like is someone gonna weld a piece of angle in the middle here and hang some Christ knows what off it? Because then you could have a beam that's perfectly within its load bearing capacity in bending and you could have the, 
web buckling taken care of with your little stiffeners between the flanges and the and the web there but the load eccentricity could cause the beam to fail in torsion okay so there's all of this convoluted stuff you've got to do you've got to evaluate the potential failure mechanisms of any system because it's bad when things collapse and it's bad when machines overheat and burn the friggin house down and it's bad when pressure vessels explode and all of that kind of thing and isn't it nice that a whole bunch of propeller headed brainiacs in R&D facilities generally take pretty good care of that stuff it's bad when you blow yourself up with petrol okay and that hardly ever happens, despite how easy it is to do that. So hashtag respect for the systematic protections that are in place all around us, okay? So let's carry that philosophy into your ute towing your trailer, okay? And think about the failure mechanisms. There could be powertrain type failure mechanisms, transmissions overheating, uh, gearbox is not strong enough to restrain the kinds of inertial loads that happen when you're configured in this manner. There are brake failures that are possible as well, like brakes turn kinetic energy into heat and they need therefore to be able to reject heat into the ambient environment. And if they can't do that quickly enough, the brakes overheat, never good, okay? But I think we can generally take those kinds of failure mechanisms out of the equation for three and a half ton towing because they're generally fairly well sorted out. Not so much the dynamic instability thing in pitch and yaw that we just talked about, which really does turn this whole situation into the tail wagging the dog right? If you're up the pointy end here, driving the dog, you don't want the tail nudging you all over the road. And it's very serious when that happens. Like you can make endless jokes about it and treat it frivolously. But in the moment when that's happening, it's life or death. So you've got to avoid that at all costs. Just the same as you've got to avoid the web buckling or the beam just bending itself into a pretzel and whatever's above it crashing down on whoever is below and also killing anyone inside, right? So these kinds of analyses are vitally important to safety. And if you're a punter towing a thing and it's heavy, you really need to think about this because there is this predisposition to instability in pitch and instability in yaw that can lead to the most catastrophic failures. So when you be an engineer in the beer garden, okay, and you finally come to the conclusion about we've got this potential failure mechanism and how do we deal with that and that potential fa failure mechanism, then you've got to talk about mitigation right because you want to be safe you want the family to get to dingo piss creek and hate every minute and curse you endlessly for years to come after you get home okay that's kind of important and the best way to mitigate this whole dynamic instability issue is to minimize the disparity in the masses between the vehicle being towed and the vehicle doing the towing because the bigger the tail and the heavier it is, the more likely it is to just nudge the dog all over the place. And I would suggest that every time you've got a trailer that's heavier than the vehicle doing the towing, that's a fundamental mistake. And yeah, you can do it. They will let you do it. It's allowed. It's just a frigging bad idea, okay? And it's especially so when you consider the nature of operation. Dingo Piss Creek is a long way from where most people live, okay? So we're not just talking about hooking up a three and a half ton boat and driving it 10 kilometers down the road to the nearest boat ramp and putting the boat in the water and then coming back and mitigating it by driving slowly and unloading the vehicle and all these things you can do to mitigate a short trip. If you're gonna drive 1500 kilometers to the guts of wherever, and 1,500 kilometres back, with three and a half tonnes behind the vehicle, you're going to be doing highway speeds. And the thing about 100, 110, is that it feels like just being in a lounge room, except you've acquired a shitload of energy. And that acquisition of energy is particularly unforgiving if you are bleeding it all the way quickly, as you do during a crash, okay? The more speed the more energy, the more potential for instability. So you've got to be careful about that. And then you've got off-road. And frankly, 
off-road and three and a half tons just doesn't mix. And I'm not talking about a dirt road, okay? I'm talking about full-on all-terrain driving in low range. Like, if you think you can do that and tow three and a half tons, you're just not being realistic about the capability of your vehicle, okay? If you're going to do severe off-road driving, you can't take three and a half tons with you. It's That's just how it is. But even if you are not doing off-road driving, there are plenty of roads out there that are just geometrically deficient. They have off-camber bends and there's mid-corner dips and mid-corner bumps and there's all of this pitching and yawing and rolling that can be induced thanks to geometric deficiencies in the road which you have not foreseen, which perhaps you hit a little bit hard and you've got a lot of energy on board, and then the tail wags the friggin' dog, and that's always bad, okay? And the final thing is unsealed surfaces and wet roads and icy roads and situations where there is low traction. Because when the tail starts to nudge the dog, the only thing stopping the whole thing from coming unglued in the worst possible way is the traction between the tyres on the tow vehicle and the road. And when that is compromised, you have to be more conservative when it comes to the vehicle that you decide to tow. So just because you're looking at the specifications one day and it says three and a half tons, yes, that does not mean that it is a good idea for you to go out and buy a three and a half ton caravan. In fact, quite the opposite. So now that we've got the philosophy out of the way, right, engineering philosophy, how to return safely, as opposed to just comply with the regulations. Let's talk about compliance. Compliance is kind of important issue, and there are two basic things that you need to consider with compliance, all right? There's a thing called the gross vehicle mass, which is relating to the vehicle that does the towing, okay? So that's your ute, your land cruiser, your patrol, whatever the friggin' hell is doing the actual tugging, okay? And the GVM is a weight, like in the case of the D-Max X Terrain, it's 3,100 kilograms, 3.1 tons. And that means the all-up fully loaded weight of the D-Max, not to exceed 3.1 tons. It's a limit, okay? And it's kind of important because if you get stopped out there on the road and they weigh you with one of those portable weigh bridges and you are over, you're not proceeding. You're also getting a big fine. So you're halfway to Dingo Piss Creek with a $100,000 caravan and you're going nowhere and here's the bill for your trouble so far, okay? Important to consider. Then you go to the specs and you look up the curb weight of the vehicle, which in this case is 2130 kilograms, okay? The bottom line there is curb weight is essentially with everything full, full tank of fuel, water in the radiator, all that stuff, but nothing else. No accessories, no passengers, no driver, okay? 2130, that is what your D-Max X-Terrain weighs ringing wet, okay? You've got to put people in it because we're going to take the family to Dingo Piss Creek, right? And I'm being so conservative here when I say that dad's about 90, mum's about 70, and three kids, 50 kilos apiece. And let's say, even if you're really, really skinny, you know, you're vegans or something, then you're going to take some stuff in the car with you, aren't you? You're going to take, the kids are going to have their electronic whatever and you might put some recovery gear, whatever. You're going to have stuff, okay? But if we just put this allowance in of 310 kilos for people at this stage, and then we say, hang on a minute, <laughs> tow bar is a genuine accessory kind of thing. It's not included in the curb weight. You've got to tick the box. With the Ming Mol over the counter, you've got to say, yeah, tow bar. Please, saxophone holder, okay, whatever. But tow bar, you're gonna to tow, you need the tow bar, it's gonna be another 50 kilos. And then, this is important too, and a lot of people don't get this, is that there is tow ball download, which is the load that the trailer imposes on the tow ball of the tow vehicle. And it's typically 10% of whatever's being towed. So three and a half tons back here, 350 kilos up here. Okay, and that is part of the vehicle's payload. You must include it in this analysis because the vehicle is carrying it when you couple up, okay? So when you do the numbers on this, you say to yourself, yeah, okay, the 2130 plus the 310 plus the 50 plus the 350 for the download, 2840, and I'm allowed 3100. <laughs> yes, 260 kilos of margin, <laughs> dingo piss creek. 
Here we come. Just hang on a sec, okay? There's another pesky little piece of compliance analysis that you've got to do, all right? And this would be the gross combination mass or the GCM. And it's also one of those limits not to exceed, in the case of the X-Terrain, 5.95 tonnes. And I don't know how they arrive at 5.95 and not 6.0. It's just some sort of engineering analysis done back in the motherland. And that's what they determine is the gross combination mass. It's the all-up weight of the vehicle with everything in it. That would be people, their stuff, accessories, whatever, plus the fully loaded weight of your trailer, which is called the ATM or aggregate trailer mass, not to exceed 3.5 tonnes in the case of the D-Max, okay? So let's do the compliance analysis on that. And in this analysis, tow ball download, you don't count it twice, okay? So when the tow ball cops its download from the trailer, 350 kilos gets taken off the rear axles of the axles of the trailer okay because that 350 is being carried by the vehicle okay so the axles of the trailer are supporting 3.15 tons and the tow ball is supporting the balance of the three and a half which is 350 kilos if you don't get that that's okay but just take my word for it because I was awake that day in engineering school, okay? Don't count the 350 kilos twice. You don't add it to the vehicle in this case. It's three and a half tons for the trailer, 2130 for the curb mass of the vehicle, and then I thought to myself, okay, let's just subtract them and see how we're going. We've got 320 kilos to go, but I didn't include the tow bar there, so I've got to take 50 kilos off the result here, and we're down to 270 kilos of legal payload, and we haven't put any people in the vehicle yet. Okay, that's kind of important, because mum and dad want to inflict Dingo Piss Creek on the three kids, okay? And in total, they're going to weigh something like 310 kilos right? So we're already 40 kilos over and we haven't put a single accessory on the vehicle that isn't a tow bar, okay? We haven't put any luggage in the vehicle whatsoever and we haven't put any equipment in the tray. So what would be the point of having a ute without stuff in the tray? And there would be stuff that you want to carry in the tray so that you've got it with you when you decouple and you can be safe at both times without reconfiguring your stuff endlessly when you do that. So... When you look at gross combination mass compliance, it is almost impossible to comply with the gross combination mass limit and still do anything practical with your vehicle, okay? Carry people and stuff. Forget it at three and a half tons. And that's why it's legally allowed. It's just not practical. Some of us still live in a world where the facts really matter, like even the inconvenient ones, especially the inconvenient ones. And the solution on that world, Harvo, is staring you in the face. And I'd have to say, D-Max is kind of okay, like it's pretty agricultural, but certainly not a pig. Support is mediocre. They milk this claim about truck-like toughness and reliability for all it's worth, in my view. But in reality, Isuzu Ute Australia is a separate company to the truck mob and the engine in the much-loved, much-hyped D-Max is a disgracefully geriatric power plant far better consigned to the annals of museum exhibit, in my view. Like, dude, it's essentially a brand new 1999 Holden Jackaroo diesel engine. Remember them. Well done, maintaining the hype for all these decades, you marketing geniuses. Argue the toss if you want, Isuzu fanboys, but despite the almost quarter century gap, these engines are essentially the same. The architecture lives on. It's like on Isuzu world, engine design peaked at the end of the 20th century and there was therefore no point investing any further cash redundantly in R&D. 
And if you want to pay 70 grand for that, like, dude, free country, knock yourself out. It's none of my beeswax. Plus, like a hundred grand for a three and a half ton acoustically transparent aluminium chitois with a water closet at the head of the dining table, and you'd like to pull up Creekside and smell that ammonia with the wife and kiddies. Okay. But you'll be doing it illegally in any of the common utes. Like, you can only hypothetically tow three and a half tons, but if you do, you can't carry the family or even a frigging cut lunch. And the manufacturers of these vehicles should hang their heads in frigging shame, in my view, for collectively suggesting not only that you can do this, but doing so is also an excellent idea, without compromise, because that's a grossly irresponsible inference for you to make, in my view. Real pulling power. Whether you need to tow a boat, caravan, or heavy trailer down the road or up a bush track, the D-Max is built for the task. D-Max models across the range have a huge three and a half ton towing capacity, so next time you're heading out on adventure, you don't need to leave anything behind. I would respectfully retort, pull the other one, you Isuzu bullshitters. You cannot put an average human adult in four of that vehicle's five seats with a three and a half ton trailer being towed behind. In fact, you need to leave just about everything out of the ute itself if you tow three and a half tons. So there's that. Running with 80 kilos, which is roughly Average for humans in North America and Europe, that's 320 kilos of flesh, plus 50 for the tow bar, plus 2,130 for the D-Max X terrain curb weight, plus three and a half tons for the chitois out the back, which equals, take away the number you first thought of, 6,000 kilos even which is 50 kilos in excess of the gross combination mass, and that's before carrying a single item in the cab or the tray, such as jerry cans or water containers or recovery gear, or fitting a single accessory, such as a roof rack, driving lights, second spare wheel and tire, a compressor, a pedestrian shredding crash safety compromiser, which you might think of as a bull bar. Therefore, that quote you just saw from Isuzu is a disgraceful misrepresentation of the reality of towing three and a half tons with that vehicle, at least in my estimation. It's from isuzuute.com.au slash dmax slash towing today, and I've archived that in case they change it. You don't need to leave anything behind, please. You need to leave just about everything behind, including some of the family, just to comply. To be fair, D-Max is probably a better choice for heavy towing than something like a Navara, which is a proper heavy towing shitbox, owing to the grubby compromises that Nissan did with three-prong to platform share the ill-fated X-Class with the Navara. Well done there. Another great call, Nissan. That's not funny at all. Certainly not funny in the boardroom. A special mention to Mitsubishi in all of this, which declines to participate in the three and a half ton towing arms race and limits the tow capacity of Triton to 3.1 tons, which is far more reasonable and practical in my estimation, not to mention far safer. And like, hey, I'm just a mechanical engineer with no particular axe to grind here, except that I don't want to see good folk like Harvo here and his fam set off on the big adventure and get halfway there and find themselves parked on the frigging roof hours from the nearest trauma centre waiting for a dust off because one of the people on board has suffered a traumatic brain injury or other high mechanism impact related problem which can all be traced back, in my view, to some marketing asshole telling the board that they can sell more utes if product planning would just agree and let their ute tow three and a half tons like everyone else's. So my strong advice about towing three and a half tons with vehicles such as this is 
don't. Or if you do, buy a four-wheel drive truck and upgrade your license and tow that big fat heavy van with that big fat heavy tow platform which will remain stable with such a big fat heavy load slung behind. And if you're not prepared to do that, then buy your ute by all means, but don't tow anything heavier than two and a half tons because physics doesn't give a shit whether you live or die out there on your big adventure. The choices you make are kind of important here. Like, sorry to be so serious about this right at the end. I don't know, spend the next few minutes thinking about boobies or something and the world will go back to seeming as rosy as it was before. Like, hey, that always seems to do the trick for me.